assumption three was that no one will sanction Russia because it's too important to the international economy. Well, whoops. And, and say what you will about the Russian economy, it's a massive exporter of energy and food products, whereas China is the largest importer of both. If you cut off China from international food supplies and the things that go into fertilizer and fuel, they will deindustrialize in under a year and a half and probably have 500 million people suffering from famine. That's the end of China as a modern industrialized power. But I think the thing that scared them the most were the boycotts. Most of the restrictions on operations in Russia were not done by governments. It was individual companies saying, we don't want to be a part of this. And that is the entire Chinese development model. So every assumption that they have made for the last 40 years to prepare for Taiwan has been proven laughably wrong. They've got to start over. And it's not clear in a one-man cult of personality government that that's even theoretically possible. So yeah, I think, I think Taiwan's going to be okay. Well, let's start with eugenics. There was a lot of things we didn't understand about population policy when that existed. And so leaving aside the, uh, the racism and the I get to play God in your life angles of that, which I would frown upon, mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we were sterilizing people who had non-genetic conditions, thinking that made a difference. Things like bad eyesight in Sweden, for example. Uh, and so I would argue that our science had not yet cut up to what some bureaucrat thought was a brilliant idea. And the damage that we did to ourselves across the world uh, was not minor. Uh, as to the competition, if that's the word you want to use, between the advanced world and parts of the other, the rest of the world that we're, you know, maybe less than enthused of at the moment, uh, I am not too concerned about that. Well, let me rephrase that. I am concerned in a very different way. Um, you are correct in that for the most part, birth rates in the Middle East have not dropped, but it's not because these areas have industrialized or built up their agricultural system. It's because they've been living on resource rents and they're able to import what they need from the advanced world uh, in order to feed themselves and have basic technology, no basic technology that sounded wrong, uh, in order to enjoy an industrial lifestyle without actually industrializing, mm -hmm. which means if you break down globalization and transport, most of them are fucked because they don't have the capacity to supply themselves and they are utterly dependent upon civilian levels of security on the high seas in order to generate the income that they need to buy what they want. And if that breaks down, they don't just have a birth rate correction, they have a population correction because these guys import, on average, more than half of their foodstuffs. So yeah, but I mean, this is sending their people to Europe and... Um, I have and no doubt that in a world of economic stress, that the Europeans will act like Europeans. There are very limited routes that you can get in, and if the Europeans decide that, that their culture is under serious threat, they will dust off some older policies and uh, do what they do best. And it'll be ugly, and we will have significant famine across most of the Middle East. Uh, I'm not so worried about Algeria and Morocco. They have more advanced systems. This is not where the migrants are coming from. Uh, and they have decent trade relations. Uh, Libya is probably gonna be occupied by the end of this. Egypt will be terrifying. Egypt, if it switched all of its farmland to wheat, it still can't feed its population. So you're looking at losing at least a third of the population, assuming climate change doesn't cause a problem, assuming they can still import the, the uh, fertilizers that they need. Saudi Arabia is probably going to enter into a de facto military pact with an outside power who will probably provide them with food in exchange for oil. And you might see echoes of that in places like Kuwait or the UAE. But overall, I think we're going to see a lot less resource exports from the overall region. And that means we're going to have population adjustments. Um, for, for the last decade or two, this transmigration issue has been an interesting test case. Because we've seen how the Europeans have responded to it in a period of physical security and economic growth. You remove those two pillars and the Europeans are going to act differently. And honestly, so are the Turks on the way and so are the Moroccans. So will we have a refugee move? Yeah.
and it'll be stopped cold. And then we're going to have some significant population adjustments uh, in a number of places. I was actually be more concerned about the Russians in Central Asia because there are fewer barriers. There are no good choke points. The level of desperation will be higher and the Russian state on the backside of this war is likely to be much weaker. I think you're going to see what you're concerned about. I think you're just concerned about the wrong part of the world. There's there's really no foreign power that thinks it's a good idea to mess around in Mexico anymore. You know, independent of the fact that the Mexicans have an order of magnitude more internal capacity now than they did a century ago. Uh, Mexico is absolutely its own thing. And since it is it and the United States are each other's top trading partner in most categories, uh, people realize that if you mess with Mexico, you mess with the United States. Uh, we are in the process of kind of extending that mindset over the rest of Central America and the Caribbean sands of Cuba. And in a world where the Chinese and the Russians are obsessed with local issues, I really do think Cuba is going to come in from the cold and we'll have a broadly productive relationship and they kind of join the NAFTA family, if you will. Uh, the, the opportunities there for manufacturing are actually quite impressive. Um, that just leaves South America. And people forget that South America is not one thing. You've got your northern tier of Colombia and Venezuela, which are separated from one another, but have Caribbean frontage. We already have a free trade deal with Colombia, and we're in the early stages of seeing their integration into NAFTA structures. Ecuador, Peru, and Chile are separated from everyone else by the Himalayas. We already have a free trade deal with the Chileans, uh, and relations with the Peruvians are reasonable. Ecuador is kind of its own thing. Uh, the only place where you can get integration within the region is the southern cone of Brazil, Argentina, and the Guays. Um, but Brazil is dependent upon international trade. Argentina is not. So we can have that part of the world, which is further from us than Europe, kind of go its own way. Uh, and as long as we keep foreign powers from using the Western Hemisphere as a foothold, it's, this, is, this is an easy carry. Uh, one of the reasons that the Monroe Doctrine worked, even though we didn't have a functional navy at the time, it, the Western Hemisphere is a long haul from the Eastern Hemisphere's land masses, especially when you're talking about places like Japan or Europe that are far north instead of far south. So we can build out a system where we incrementally expand the economic orbit of NAFTA to countries that are willing uh, and eager, I might add. Um, while at the same time, we basically put up a bit of an invisible barrier around the hemisphere to prevent others from coming in and engaging in anything cute. Uh, it used to be that the Russians slash Soviets were very active in places like Ecuador or Mexico or Venezuela or Granada or Cuba. But we've seen a complete collapse of the Russian position globally because of the Ukraine war. They need everything that they have in that war. And they've closed down the Wagner operations in Africa. They've pulled almost all of their equipment out of Armenia and Syria. They've removed their bases from the Chinese border. They've even closed down their bases on the border with Finland, which is about to join NATO. Everything they have is going to Ukraine. And win or lose, they will not be able to rebuild their positions in most places, which makes Monroe that much easier. Uh Depends. If the, uh, if the Russian nuclear arsenal proves to be as in bad of shape as everything else in the Russian military, oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, Eastern Siberia is in play. Uh, but they're going to wait for the Russians to launch and fail to launch before they would make that decision. Now, I personally don't think the Russians are going to hit the big red button. I think the case for that is past. It used to be that they were seriously considering nuking Berlin, Warsaw, Stockholm, Paris, and London in order to disrupt the weapons flows into Ukraine. But at the Battle of Izium last month, the Ukrainians captured, in 36 hours, more equipment from the Russians than NATO had transferred in seven months. So the Ukrainians now, their biggest problem is like deferred maintenance on Russian equipment. Um, and if they decided they wanted to go for, say, the United States, we made it very clear to Putin that if you do hit the U.S., uh, the first person will die, who dies is everyone who's in the blast radius of the weapon that is targeting Putin personally. And so he doesn't get to write the history here. Uh, history will record him as the person who destroyed the Russian Federation. And since then, he personally has not threatened nukes. He's left it to his flunkies.